So thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to the world of pharmacogenetics in Estonia. And um, we'll just start with uh, why is it important to study pharmacogenetics? In general, the effectiveness of treatments is far from optimal. So about 30 to 60% of people don't respond to medications prescribed in the first line and uh, about a 50% of phase three clinical trials fail. Studies have also shown that the success in clinical trials is uh, at least two times higher when genetics is accounted for uh, from the beginning in the drug development process. The second topic is uh, safety questions around treatments. About five to 13% of hospitalizations are caused by side effects or reverse events of medications. And overall, we know that uh, although the therapeutic index of many drugs is uh, pretty broad and uh, it, pretty fine, uh, one size doesn't fit all. And in some cases, uh, there is a long period of trial and error and months of optimization before reaching the optimal dose for uh, specific patients. So our main question is, could genetics help us in this process? And while uh, um, Dr. Markus Wiekema and uh, Hannes Jürgens both presented uh, great pilot projects in Estonia that are piloting the implementation of genetics, uh, or specifically polygenic risk scores in prevention of cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer. Then for pharmacogenetics, there is a lot of evidence already speaking for its implementation. And I will try to give an overview of that and how the Estonian strategy is actually based on, on using already published guidelines and uh, recommendations in pharmacogenetics. So the variation in drug response is actually caused by a lot of different uh, factors, whether a person is taking in the drug, whether it's absorbed slowly or rapidly, uh, and then getting to the liver, is the person a slow, efficient, ultra-rapid metabolizer? And finally, we have a lot of variation in drug targets, uh, whether there's a, a specific binding or non-binding and um, receptor interactions. And finally, excretion, how well does a person actually get rid of the byproducts of this metabolism process. And we can have genetic variants in, in all of this pathway that affect how much uh, the drug concentration or how rapidly this is all eliminated from the body. And the task of pharmacogenetic, pharmacogenetics is to explain, predict the response of a patient to a specific drug therapy and to, of course, avoid uh, adverse events and non-response. And the biggest family of uh, enzymes in this process is the cytochrome P450 that is responsible of the metabolism of about 80% of drugs. So for uh, specifically CYP3A4, it's very important in oncology, some psychiatric drugs, and uh, CYP2D6 is very important for antidepressives, antipsychotics, some beta blockers, and cancer treatment. And we have uh, CYP2C9 is also important, particularly in anticoagulation. And CYP2C19 is very important for specific antidepressants and pedogrel. And uh, together, they, they are the most relevant family of genes for drug metabolism. And if we look at the inter-individual variation in drug metabolism, having a thousand people given the same drug at the same dose and measuring the uh, concentration of the drug in the blood plasma eight hours later, we get a kind of normal distribution uh, with a long tail uh, because particularly for sub 2 d 6 we see this kind of variation uh, or a lot of genetic polymorphisms that affect this process. So it's not only genetic variants and uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, but it's also duplications, deletions, and structural variation in the gene that causes uh, some people to have very low concentrations. These are ultra-rapid metabolizers. 
uh, some extensive metabolizers, some intermediate, and then uh, poor metabolizers. And we see up to a thousand fold difference in the concentration of a medication in their plasma. So based on this information already 15 years ago, Julia Kirscheiner, uh, who is uh, now Julia Stingel and uh, works at uh, the drug uh, agency in Germany. Uh, so 50 years ago, she proposed that we should start genotype-based dosing of medications, where based on your genotype, you would then get either 20 or up to 180% of the standard dose for an individual. And we knew a lot about these genetic variants back then as well. And so either you have these duplications and you have loss of function mutations or deletions that actually cause the need for a higher or lower dose respectively. And uh, this has been known for many different genes, but for some reason, the implementation has lagged tremendously. And uh, in some hospitals uh, that are fast, well advanced, uh, at, for example, we have a representative here from Erasmus Rotterdam, uh, they do single gene testing uh, prior to prescription. And um, I think they are very good pioneers in, in uh, the Netherlands as well, looking at how to implement pharmacogenetics in the clinical care. And um, in Estonia, we're trying to take an approach of uh, a broader approach that the data should be there preemptively. Uh, we would have it uh, calculated for many different genes and many different uh, activations or medications at the same time. So that the moment that the doctor is prescribing a medication, then the data is already there. And uh, the different very well established uh, other findings are, for example, SLCO1B1 gene and uh, myopathy from uh, simvastatin treatment. is a very clear allelic effect of the CC genotype of this gene. And 60% of myopathy cases are associated with the C allele of the SLCO1B1 gene. And they also display a higher plasma concentration of the uh, simvastatin. We also have examples of hypersensitivity reactions uh, that can be uh, actually present. Uh, so it was, <laughs> the slide is a bit messed up, but 100% of the individuals who, with a hypersensitivity reaction were carriers of the HLA-57 or one allele. And when they did a randomized controlled trial, then they found that 50% of the individuals with this allele got a hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, there are also other tests that have been um, evaluated uh, for preemptive tests. So uh, whether using genetic guided uh, prescription will help uh, or increase improved treatment outcomes, reduce costs and uh, reduce side effects. And in all these different tasks, we see the benefit of genetic uh, testing and improved outcomes whether it's uh, uh, treatment of depression, for example, and preemptive testing in, in psychiatry. You see at least uh, uh, on average, then in the meta-analysis, 1.7 fold improvement in treatment outcomes. And uh, clopidogrel is another example where they see you have uh, star 2 or loss of function variant carriers of CYP2C19, uh, they are not able to activate the prodrug into, uh, and to achieve the uh, effect that they are supposed to get. So doctors have moved away from using clopidogrel, which otherwise was a very effective um, medication to prevent heart attacks and strokes and uh, cardiovascular events. And here they've shown that preemptive genetic testing with uh, for CYP2C19 uh, can improve treatment outcomes several fold as well and uh, prevent uh, stent thrombosis and other early events. And in oncology, there is an example of uh, DPYD preemptive testing and how they were able to reduce toxicity reactions. 
uh, and the incidence of cigarette toxicity by you doing a systematic literature review and, and then did the DPYD wild type patients. If they were wild type, they would get the, the normal dose. And if they were star 2A carriers, they would get a 50% lower dose and they were able to re reduce toxicity reactions threefold. So there is plenty of evidence for the implementation of pharmacogenetics, uh, but still it is it's not an easy task. So there have been several hurdles along the way. Uh, one is definitely uh, the cost of genetic testing. The second is uh, the time you have to wait for the results and uh, how do we make it um, instant at the point of care. And the uh, regulations and uh, accessibility, IT infrastructure, uh, decision support software, and training of clinicians, these are all issues that have been raised. So in Estonia, we're trying to address this on, on many different levels in collaboration with the, uh, first of all, uh, close collaboration with the computer scientists at the University of Tartu and on the national level with the Institute for uh, Public Health and Health Development and the uh, Ministry of Social Affairs and other partners. So the approach we have taken in Estonia is to take very clear recommendations from uh, the CPIC, where the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, and uh, we also compare this to the Dutch Pharmacogenetics Working Group, then uh, Farmware for checking different alleles and, uh, and other published recommendations for, for prescriptions. And overall, we see that 99% of individuals carry at least one genetic variant that affects drug response. So we see that we need to move faster for this work. And uh, taking all these uh, recommendations and translating existing genetic data into uh, pharmacogenetic recommendations was so challenging that we wrote a paper about it together with uh, Sula Reisberg and uh, uh, Christy Krebs and Jaak Vilo at uh, combining the skills of geneticists and, uh, and computer scientists. So we had to create different algorithms to account for uh, first defining different star alleles using uh, automated bioinformatics. And you could, for example, have several different variants that define a specific star allele, uh, but you could also have specific variants defining uh, the same alleles or, or having too many variants that match different alleles and you don't have a perfect match. So we made a decision tree process for how we could actually uh, prioritize loss of function mutations, for example, if you carry a loss of function variant, it doesn't matter too much what, what other variants you have on that allele and so on. And uh, this is an illustration of the decision tree that we had to create uh, to create as much, uh, to not lose too much data. Uh, so we first phase the genotype data or sequencing data, and then we first check for non-functional star alleles if there are no matches, we continue to check for all other star alleles, and then uh, try to fit, narrow it down to one matching star allele for each uh, individual. And overall, we did this for whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, the global screening array and OmniExpress array. And for the microarrays, we also used imputation and uh, using the Estonian population-specific reference panel that Andres Metzbal also mentioned yesterday. So one thing that we observed was that uh, the microarrays actually performed really well in comparison to whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. What is clear is that you, you miss one of the star alleles, the star 17 in CYP2C19, by exome sequencing, but it is very well covered by whole genome or genotyping arrays because it's in a regulatory region outside of genes. And the same goes for CYP2C9. And for CYP2D6, uh, these genotyping arrays also perform surprisingly well. And although the, the most important star 4 allele is not present on the array, 
but we're able to impute it with a very high efficiency uh, using this Estonian specific preference panel. We have actually validated this using ITACMAN genotyping assays and the accuracy is 99.6%. And uh, the final part is uh, currently we have returned results to Biobank participants and created these kind of pharmacogenetic reports uh, that um, then contain the, the star reliefs that are defined and the, the recommendations that come from CPIC uh, and which medications or activations that are affected. And here's just an example of a female uh, with depression who had actually been prescribed, um, sorry, uh, escitalopram and sertraline and experienced severe side effects. And when she was receiving the genetic counseling, she shared this information and was very surprised that this information is actually there in my genes. How come doctors don't know this and don't account for this? So this is the general goal that we hope to, uh, first of all, build the algorithms now into um, tools that can be used in the clinic. So it needs a lot more validation and uh, documentation and uh, registration. Yeah, CE marking and, and all these different bits that are important before getting them into the healthcare clinic and all of the IT solutions that Professor Jaak Vilo mentioned yesterday as well. But, uh, that's an overview of the work and the different partners that have been involved in, in this whole process uh, are in front of you right now. So thank you for your attention.